Okay, in this video we're going to look at finding the center of mass of two-dimensional or three-dimensional objects. And so there are some formulas here. We use double or triple integrals to do that. Uh, and so I just want to talk a little bit about what these formulas are saying, what center of mass is, and then we'll look at an example. The center of mass is a point, so that's important to understand. Center of mass is a point, either two-dimensional or three-dimensional point. And we've got some equations. So you might notice on the denominator of all of these is a mass integral. And there's this delta function on all of these. That delta function is a mass density of the object at the point x, y, or for a three-dimensional object, a density of the object at the point x, y, z. Okay, so uh, you have this density function. You also might notice that on all of these, the denominator is the same integral, so you shouldn't evaluate that over and over again. Uh, the numerator on all of these is an integral that has an extra variable in it. So for the x-coordinate center of mass, I've got an extra x here. For the y-coordinate center of mass, I've got an extra y. And similarly, in three dimensions, an extra x or an extra y or an extra z. The numerator on all of these are called the first moment with respect to an axis or a plane. And that is a calculation that you might study some more if you take some physics. It describes the tendency of an object to rotate about an axis or a plane. Um, for our purposes right here, we're really going to mostly be calculating center of masses. So you're going to have several different integrals to do here. I do just want to look at one example just to understand what that is that we're calculating so that you can think about whether your answers are reasonable or not. So off here to the side, I've got a picture of a piece of cardboard that I just cut into an irregular shape. And so that's a two-dimensional object. So that would be like a, a region R. And if you're going to find the center of mass for that, and you had equations that describe the edges of it, you could use some integration to do that. But conceptually, I want to emphasize what the idea of the center of mass is. The idea for a two-dimensional object, anyway, is that it's like a balancing point. And so in the second picture here, you can see I balanced that region that I cut out of cardboard onto the end of my pen there. And my cardboard has uniform density because it's the same material on the whole region. So for the one with uniform density, the center of mass would really be the geometric center. So it's approximately right there. I took the same piece of cardboard and added a couple of binder clips to one edge of it. So that means that that edge is going to have more mass to it. So that's going to shift where that center of mass is, where that balancing point is. And then I balanced it on the end of my pen again. And you can see there that that center of mass has shifted. A little bit. So this would be one with non-constant mass density because I've got these extra binder clips on one side of it. For a three-dimensional object, you can think about a center of mass as the place where the object would be concentrated if you wanted to represent that object that is has some larger geometry as a single point. And so if I have some three-dimensional object that say has more mass on the bottom because things have settled a little bit, then the center of mass for that would be closer perhaps at the bottom, but that would represent a point where you might represent that three-dimensional object as a single point. And so we do that sometimes in things like uh, motion in space, where we might represent a whole planet as a single point, even though it's not really a single point. We'd represent that at it, where its center of mass is. We're going to look at an example. All right, so for this one, I'm going to find the center of mass for a solid with constant density. So it doesn't tell me what my density is here, but that's going to be some constant. I'm just going to use k for my constant density. And our solid is bounded by these two equations of these two surfaces. So I'm going to need a picture of that. My first equation is a paraboloid with vertex at 12 and opens down. Hopefully you're getting to the place where you start to recognize some of those. If not, you do the individual traces and see what that surface looks like. The second one is the top half of a cone that opens upward. The sides would be z equals plus or minus y, z equals plus or minus x. We've looked at that same cone a few different times. The sides form 45 degree angles with the coordinate axes. So again, I don't need a beautiful sketch here, but I do need a reasonable sketch. I've got this cone opening upward, and I have a paraboloid opening downward. And so what I'm looking for is the region bounded by both of those. So there would be a place here where they intersect. And we've got the paraboloid on the top 
and the cone on the bottom, sort of like a, a snow cone or something like that. Um, so that would be our region. And at some point we probably are gonna need to figure out the place where those two surfaces intersect. All right, so we want to find the center of mass. One important thing here is that our density is constant. And this region that I've drawn is pretty symmetric. It is symmetric with respect to X and with respect to Y. The cross sections on both of my surfaces here are circles parallel to the XY plane. So if you think about this a little bit and think about the idea of the balancing point and where this object would be concentrated, because I have constant density here, it's the same density throughout, the center of mass would really be the geometric center of this region. And so in the X and Y directions, that center of mass should be at zero. So if you can think about that a little bit, that maybe saves you some calculation that the X coordinate of center of mass and the Y coordinate of center of mass will be zero. And I really just need to figure out the Z coordinate of the center of mass. Uh, so how high the geometric center of that region would be. Now that only works if you have constant density that you can use that kind of symmetry to think about that. So if you don't have constant density, then you need to probably set up all those integrals. All right, so I just need to find my Z coordinate of the center of mass. So I'm gonna go ahead and write those formulas down here. I have a three dimensional region. So I'm gonna be doing a triple integral of Z times my density function. So that's my constant K. And then on the denominator, I'll just be integrating my density function. All right, there is some cancellation here. Uh, there's also some cancellation that sometimes occasionally I see a student try to do and it doesn't work. My constant K is a constant. I can pull that out front of the integrals and my constants will cancel. That's all that cancels. Uh, sometimes I see students try to cross out the integral signs and the DV. You should know better than that by now. There are some in the textbook where they actually set the constant density equal to one just because it's going to cancel anyway. And so uh, the idea is that it doesn't matter what that constant is. Okay, I have two different integrals to calculate now. And so my advice is to calculate those separately and then go back up here and plug them into our answer at the end. So I'm gonna do my numerator integral. And so I wanna look at my region and think about whether it is X simple, Y simple, or Z simple. It is only Z simple. When I go through that region in the direction of increasing Z, I enter through the cone and I leave through the paraboloid. The other thing that you should notice here, we've looked at some other examples like this, is that the cross sections in the XY direction are all circles. The shadow of that region down into the XY plane is gonna be a circle. And so because of that, that should be telling you that you probably are gonna to wanna to use polar coordinates in the X and Y directions. So you have two choices about how you can do that. One is to set the integral up with just the Z part first and leave the XY to set up later. Or once we've learned a little bit more, when we've learned about cylindrical coordinates, cylindrical coordinates is essentially just polar coordinates in XY and ordinary rectangular coordinates in Z. Maybe you'll go ahead and set this up just completely in cylindrical coordinates from the beginning. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and do this integral. Okay, so I integrated with respect to Z. So I was integrating Z with respect to Z. I got one half Z squared, and now I'll need to plug in my limits of integration. At this point, maybe you're tempted to do some simplifying, but do remember that we decided we probably are gonna convert to polar coordinates. So I'll actually do my simplifying after I convert to polar coordinates. So I need to go back up and look at my picture a little bit here to make sure I'm clear about what the RXY region is. When I look at the RXY though, I wanna think about where the cone and the paraboloid intersect each other. And that is gonna give me that radius of that shadow down in the XY plane. So in order to find that place where the cone and the paraboloid intersect each other, I'm gonna to have to solve some kind of system of equations to do that. I am gonna go ahead and solve for z, and then once I know the z, I'll be able to find x and y. The algebra is just a little bit easier that way when I solve for z. So for my second equation, I'm gonna rewrite that as z squared equals x squared plus y squared, and then I'm gonna substitute in for x squared plus y squared into my first equation if I factor out a minus sign. 
and then I'm going to add z squared and subtract 12 from both sides. Okay, so I got z equals negative 4 and z equals 3. The z equals negative 4 would be if I extend that cone downward, and if I extend the paraboloid downward, would be down here where I'm not interested in, where they would intersect. The z equals 3 is the one that I'm interested in where they intersect up here at the top. Right, what I really need is the radius of my circle, but I can use then either of my two equations, put in z equals 3, and I get my equation of my circle. So my rxy that I'm going to be integrating over here is this circle of radius 3. Okay, so then that allows me to set up my limits of integration in polar coordinates. Okay, so at this step, I went ahead and just pulled my 1 half, both of these 1 halves. I went ahead and pulled those outside of the integral. I expanded out the 12 minus r squared, the quantity squared, and distributed through the r on that. And then I also had another term that would give me an r cubed from the back end here. So when I did all that simplifying, I have this. I skipped some steps of algebra there. You want to make sure that you do that algebra correctly, because if not, everything else is going to end up wrong. So just be careful about that. If you need to write out more steps of algebra, then do that. I'm now ready to integrate with respect to r. Okay, so I went ahead and did my integration, plugged in my numbers, did some simplifying, and then I now need to just integrate with respect to theta. Okay, so that gives me my answer for one of the integrals. My other integral that I need to do is going to be the denominator. And one thing you should notice about that other integral is that that other integral is really just the volume of the region in this case. Not always, but that's because our constants canceled out here, our density functions canceled. Uh, so if it was a region that I just knew the volume of, I could just write down that volume. In this case, I don't. So we're going to go ahead and actually calculate that. Here I've got the integral set up with dz on the inner integral. I'm going to convert to polar once I do this first integration. All right, so I've done my integration with respect to z, plugged in my limits of integration, and now we're going to convert to polar. It's the same region as before, so your limits of integration are going to be the same. Okay, so that is my answer for that denominator integral. I need to remember to go back up to my original problem. Okay, so at this step, I have now put in my answer from my first integral divided by my answer from my second integral. There is some nice simplification that you can do there. You get 117 over 22, which is approximately 5.3. It's a good idea to get a decimal approximation for that so that you can think about whether that seems reasonable or not. Remembering that our paraboloid has a z-intercept of 12, and remembering that these two things intersect at z equals 3, so 5.3-ish sounds like a reasonable answer there. One other thing about this, your answer, remember, is a point. So if you want to write your answer nicely, you really should write your answer as a point zero zero comma 117 over 22.